I'm uh, Victor Tries. I am uh, almost uh, finished with my uh, PhD at Delft University of uh, Technology and also the Meteorological Institute uh, of the Netherlands, KNMI. And I'm investigating shadows in satellite data, um, in either the shadows of clouds, but also the shadow of the moon during a solar eclipse, because we can learn a lot from shadows as the, light is, uh, the sunlight is diminished, um, the light paths change in the atmosphere, but also the atmosphere maybe can change. So there's a lot to uh, discover there, and that is what I'm working on. Solar eclipses already have been studied for many centuries. Um, the first report of, um, of clouds that were observed um, by meteorologists um, was in 1836 that I found. Um, and there it was also already mentioned that even the cumulus clouds uh, diminished and also could uh, disappear during the eclipse. It was an eclipse in the UK. Um, and later also people have been observed this uh, from the Earth's surface, that clouds can disappear. If you stand on the Earth's surface and you look at clouds, then you can count the clouds and see them disappear. Um, however, that only provides anecdotal evidence. Um, it does not tell you from what moment precisely the clouds already are affected by the eclipse, um, because the clouds constantly change size and shape, but also uh, you don't know what would have happened without the solar eclipse. So if you want to quantify the effect of solar eclipses on clouds, it helps to look from space with uh, Earth observation satellites, because then you can observe many clouds simultaneously in a large area. And that's what we did. We recovered satellite data during solar eclipses, and we studied the uh, cloud evolution inside the shadow of the moon. Yeah. Partial eclipse has a similar effect. Um, I can explain. It, it works like this, the, also in the path of totality. So that is the small path over the Earth's surface where you can experience a total solar eclipse. The total solar eclipse only lasts for several minutes. But before the total solar eclipse, there is also a large phase, uh, a long phase, I should say, of uh, more than an hour, um, where there's a partial eclipse phase. And in the partial eclipse phase, there are obscuration percentages of the sun from 0% uh, gradually increasing up to 100% when there is the total solar eclipse. And we found that the clouds already are different than if no solar eclipse would have occurred at 15% obscuration of the sun. So then there's still plenty of light outside. It's a partial solar eclipse and people commonly do not realize an eclipse is happening. But we now found evidence that the cloud cover is already affected. However, it's important to note that not all clouds disappear, only the uh, shallow cumulus clouds that are the small patchy clouds that you typically find on a sunny day, they can disappear. They are also at a low altitude, uh, but larger cloud systems or high clouds do typically not disappear and they can still ruin your view during eclipse day. And also only the shallow cumulus clouds over land uh, react and not over ocean. That's also what we found in our study. We also have uh, cloud model simulations uh, in our university. And uh, there we model the physical evolution of, uh, of those shallow cumulus clouds. And during a solar eclipse, there's less sunlight that reaches the ground and that initiates a chain reaction of all kinds uh, of physical phenomena um, in our atmosphere. So first, the land surface cools because less sunlight reaches the Earth's surface. Then there is a diminished heat flux from the ground into the uh, lowest atmosphere layer. And that kills the convection. So the rise of warm and relatively moist air that normally causes uh, shallow cumulus clouds. So if there's no convection, also the shallow cumulus clouds cannot form. And, um, and then the clouds disappear. What actually first happens is also interesting, I think, is that um, at this 15% obscuration percentage, the clouds first stop growing. Huh? And that is very difficult to see by eye when you stand on the Earth's surface because you don't have a reference. As I said, you don't know what would have happened without solar eclipse. But uh, if you then have a cloud model, 
in, uh, in the computer, then you also can simulate the day uh, without solar eclipse. And then you can see that uh, the clouds already also disappear at those small uh, obscuration percentages. Um, so yes, we do understand it. And uh, it also gives us an insight actually into the uh, physical processes in the Earth's atmosphere, because I said it has to do with the rising air. But there's also a time lag between the clouds disappearing and the land surface cooling, because we also took measurements of the cooling of the land surface. And we see that the clouds disappear about 15 to 20 minutes later than the cooling of the land surface. And that is because the air needs some time to rise from the ground to the cloud base. So actually, uh, if you see the clouds disappearing at 50% obscuration percentage, the cost of the disappearance of clouds at 15% obscuration percentage is already at smaller obscuration percentages. That is because the air needs some time to rise. Over the ocean, we do not see this effect because the ocean surface does not cool down that fast. That is because um, there is efficient mixing of water from the ocean surface to deeper water layers. And also, uh, water has a relatively large uh, heat capacity. Climate change can be mitigated by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. However, we hope that this uh, happens in time. And it might be that we need technological solutions in the future to cool down the, temp uh, the, the Earth. Um, this is, those techniques are called geoengineering techniques. One of the proposed strategies is to uh, put artificial shadows on the Earth. That is, for example, by re uh, injecting reflecting particles high in the atmosphere, uh, the so-called stratosphere, or by placing solar cells in space that reflect the sunlight. Uh, only a few percent of, uh, of, uh, of blocking of sunlight is needed to reach um, the desired temperature again. But locally, you can uh, experience larger obscuration percentages. For example, when the particles are not distributing homogeneously over, um, over the Earth, then you can have partial solar eclipses. But we find that during a solar eclipse, the clouds can disappear. And that's actually what you don't want when, when you do uh, geoengineering, because clouds normally reflect sunlight. They are white, they have a so-called large albedo, and they help already to cool down the Earth. So um, disappearing clouds could partly oppose the intended effect of uh, solar geoengineering. And our research shows that clouds are highly sensitive to changes in the amount of sunlight that reaches the Earth. So our findings could be a warning for those geoengineering techniques. And th this calls for more research on, uh, on the impact of geoengineering on clouds. And I want to add to, to that, that the current research uh, in solar geoengineering is based on uh, model simulations uh, and, uh, and model predictions. They work um, with assumptions. Those assumptions have uncertainties as well. Um, but during a solar eclipse, we can do real measurements because solar eclipses happen in the real world. And uh, that is very valuable. So also our measurements can be used as a benchmark for those cloud models and to improve our uh, predictions uh, during also the solar geoengineering scenario. Actually, uh, this is not part of my PhD uh, plan. Uh, I, I was doing a PhD the last four years uh, on the shadows of clouds. Uh, so another type of shadow, but uh, shadows of clouds are quite complex uh, because they're relatively complex compared to solar eclipses because the shape of a cloud shadow can be very different for every cloud because clouds have also different shapes. But uh, we very well understand geo geometrically the shadow of the moon. It is very useful if you want to understand what happens to also gases and aerosols in the atmosphere, because that is what, that is what I was investigating in the beginning. To look at the shadow of the moon, what happens with the gases and the aerosols. And uh, I used actually the solar eclipses as a starting point for my research. And then I found already very early in my PhD that if I wanted to study the data of gases and aerosols, I needed to recover the satellite data. And with this recovering technique, 
I could also look at clouds during solar eclipses. And that's how I ended up doing this research. I will unfortunately not be able to see the eclipse in the Netherlands because it is already after sunset. Uh, I see that the eclipse is on a Monday evening, uh, the 8th of April. So that is normally my uh, swimming evening. So I will be in the swimming pool. Uh, but of course, I also will follow the news. Um, and hopefully we'll, we will get some nice satellite data because uh, this eclipse actually crosses a large part over land, uh, over the North American continent. Um, and it will cross different surface types. And also the, uh, the moment during the day the eclipse kicks in is different uh, locally. Uh, in the uh, west of the US and the east of the US, the eclipse locally will happen earlier uh, during the day in the west of the US than uh, uh, in the east. So uh, that is all uh, the, all different uh, information that we can use maybe to, to learn more about the sensitivity of clouds uh, to solar eclipses and uh, hopefully also have nice uh, data of disappearing clouds uh, the 8th of April.